Shin Godzilla was a massive undertaking, and this video will leave many of its stones unturned, but it will cover at least a few of Shin Godzilla's most interesting background details, production highlights, and fun facts. Likely due to the great deal of success Hideaki Anno had been enjoying with the rebuild of Evangelion films, the at the time most recent entry of that series, You Cannot Redo, grossed nearly $70 million at Japanese box office in 2012, and due to the success of the tokusatsu exhibition that Anno and Shinji Higuchi put together, which attracted over 480,000 spectators across two and a half years to view old tokusatsu movie and TV props, Toho approached Hideaki Anno to direct a Godzilla film, though it took a lot of effort on Toho's part to convince him to make one. Starting in January 2013, owing to his exhaustion from the most recent Evangelion film, and his appreciation for the original Godzilla film, Anno turned down the studio on more than a few occasions. Nevertheless, after Toho's earnest pursuit over the following months, and encouragement from longtime collaborator Shinji Higuchi, Anno would accept the task. But, once Toho won him over, Anno and co-director Higuchi had to figure out what to do with the first Japanese Godzilla film in over a decade, and there was a lot writing against them. The second attempt at an American Godzilla film, Godzilla 2014, performed well enough globally, but its Japanese performance was not nearly as impressive, and suggested the popularity of the kaiju genre had not recovered since its early 21st century collapse. Pacific Rim's weaker performance there a year earlier wasn't an encouraging sign either. So in short, the men were tasked with making a niche genre film that met the demands of a modern audience, and they would only have one tenth of a Hollywood budget with which to do it. It was going to be a challenge. Nevertheless. Anno met that challenge with these words. With my best friend standing beside me, we will triumph over the pressure that would otherwise make me run far away. But who sometimes doesn't get the urge to run away? If you can use some escapism this holiday season, look no further than this video sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends, a world filled with countless champions and endless content, where you can jump into a PvP arena battle, test your skills in challenging boss fights, and maybe become the champion you've always dreamed of. I'd beat my worries into submission with champions like Elhane, a babe who can really dish out the damage, or like Warpriest and Marauder, well-balanced characters who can be relied on in both offense and defense. But that's just me. You can choose from hundreds of champions with unique abilities to build a team that best suits your playing style. And Raid is the gift that keeps on giving because here's something special they prepared for all new players this Christmas. Get ready to celebrate the 12 days of Raid. Download Raid Shadow Legends from the links below, copy your player ID from in-game, and then go to 12daysofraid.plarium.com, link in the description below. Enter your player ID, then set out on a fun festive adventure that lasts 12 days, running from December 19th to January 10th. Each day, experience a new chapter of this wintry story and play a new minigame for a chance to win some amazing in-game and real-life prizes, including holiday-themed Raid Champions and even Amazon gift cards worth up to $1,000. But for you existing Raid players, don't think you're being left out. Head to 12daysofraid.plarium.com where you can find a special holiday promo code that everyone can use for a small festive gift. And one more thing, whether you're a new or returning player, just log in and play Raid for 7 days between now and February 20th to get a legendary champion based off MMA and pro wrestling legend, Ronda Rousey. Yes, Ronda Rousey. You can get Rousey with Ronda for free right now. Just enter promo code Raid Ronda in game, and all of these goodies can be yours. If you haven't started playing Raid yet, click my link in the description or scan my QR code here on screen to get free champion Tay Rail, 200,000 silver, one energy refill, one XP boost, and one ancient shard so you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in game. And now, back to business. Some of the earliest points decided upon for Shin Godzilla were that the main character would be a politician or bureaucrat. There would be no monster fighting. It wouldn't feature children. The word kaiju would not be used. The film would address the 311 Great East Japan earthquake and nuclear accident in Fukushima, which the at the time Japanese Prime Minister Naoto Kan described as the toughest and most difficult crisis for Japan since the end of World War II. And finally, it was agreed the best chance at recreating the impact of the original Godzilla was, like the original film, present a story where Godzilla appears for the first time in the modern world. A break from the usual route of connecting everything to the 1954 film itself. While homage and respect are paid to it, Anno had no intention on simply remaking the original Godzilla film. He considers the 1954 film to be a masterpiece, his favorite work in the tokusatsu genre, and the greatest giant monster film ever. And, believing that it already skillfully accomplished what it sought to do, Anno wanted to go in a different direction with his film. Though before proper scripting could begin, development hit a major roadblock. There was contention regarding the 311 connections and the matter of radioactivity. 
311, also known as the March 11, 2011, Tohoku earthquake, was one of the most powerful earthquakes in recorded history, and its accompanying tsunami caused the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster, the worst nuclear accident since Chernobyl back in the late 1980s. The triple disaster of the earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear fallout left hundreds of thousands of people dead, injured, or displaced, and resulted in unprecedented levels of destruction. The nightmare was compounded by a lackluster government response and bitter wintry weather. So, hardly two years removed from the 9.1 magnitude earthquake and its equally devastating after effects, Toho was very concerned about the use of 311 in what was primarily meant to be an entertainment film. And, according to Anno, I heard some people within Toho had quite extreme opinions, saying that it would be fine if Godzilla didn't emit radiation because it was a very sensitive issue. And, in all fairness, Anno himself admitted he was also concerned about striking the right balance between handling the subject matter respectfully and making an entertaining film. During production, he thought, When I think about the people who were actually affected, I feel like I can't do anything because I am atrophied. Still, he felt it would be inappropriate not to address 311 in some fashion, and he was unwilling to lose the radioactive side of Godzilla, an element that had been there since the beginning. The original Godzilla film, despite being only nine years removed from the end of the Second World War, dealt somewhat bluntly with the anxieties of its age, deliberately calling to mind and sometimes directly mentioning the H-bomb testing, the firebombing of Tokyo, the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, even opening with a scene evocative of the Lucky Dragon No. 5 incident, an accident in which Japanese fishermen were irradiated by an American H-bomb test gone wrong and sparked a national outrage, an event that happened only months before the film's release. And while the film was a smash hit and has gone on to become one of the most acclaimed Japanese films ever, at release it was accused by some of being exploitative. That was the long shadow of glory this new project existed within. And although Anno didn't want to simply remake the original film, he did want to make an equally meaningful one. If Shin Godzilla was to even begin to mean to its Japan what the original film meant to the Japan of yesterday, it could not afford to avoid the problems of its time. And 311 is without question one of the most sensitive nerves of early 21st century Japan. And so once again, Anno decided he mustn't run away, because, as he expressed in his initial press statement for Shin Godzilla, Godzilla exists in a world of science fiction, not only of dreams and hopes, but he's a caricature of reality, a satire, a mirror image. Recently, Japan has also been careless in the way it has attempted to depict him. In short, this Godzilla had to be more than just another Godzilla film. It had to mean something. And that's the ambition the filmmakers committed themselves to. Therefore, as co-director Shinji Higuchi would later share in a 2022 interview with Vulture, we tried to use monsters to reflect the social problems of the time. The Fukushima meltdown and the Tohoku earthquake are the sort of natural disasters that we haven't seen in several hundred years. In a way, those disasters are the kaiju of our day. Ultimately, after some heated back and forth discussion, the solution was never to explicitly acknowledge 311 and to reduce the severity of Godzilla's radiation in the end by giving it a uniquely short half-life. This both sides could live with. As executive producer of Shin Godzilla, Akihiro Yamauchi noted, 311 was the source of fear and anxiety in Japan. It was important to use Godzilla as a symbol to depict that fear and anxiety. With those points settled, and because he wanted someone he could trust to write a hard, political suspense story, Anno turned to Kenji Kamiyama who at the time was best recognized for Ghost in the Shell, Standalone Complex, and Eden of the East. Kamiyama would start the process of molding the existing ideas into an actual story, and he essentially provided the framework for what we know as Shin Godzilla. Of course, plenty of things were changed or didn't make the final cut at all. For example, concepts that could be interpreted as nationalistic, such as foreign countries actually launching their nukes at Japan, and Godzilla revealing new abilities to take the nukes out himself, or Japan saving the day on its own, were replaced by sentiment more in line with the original Godzilla director Ishiro Honda's Brotherhood of Mankind themes, though details that survived until the end include Godzilla's sudden appearance, the battles with the Japanese self-defense force, the freezing operation, and Godzilla's petrification. Once Kamiyama left the project in fall 2013, due to prior commitment with Napping Princess, an anime film he would write and direct, Anno assumed writing duties for Shin Godzilla himself. Anno did loads of research, which included talking to just about anyone from all walks of life. Ordinary people directly impacted by 311, politicians and bureaucrats from all levels of government, and various parties throughout the Japanese Self-Defense Force. He and the staff even visited areas affected by 311. All of this done in the name of getting as close to realism as possible. Anno explained, I think the theme of the film can be realized by raising the level of reality, or rather, by raising the intensity of the real world. So that's what I had to focus on first and foremost. Since we've been dealing with the aftermath of 311, we had no choice but to deal with the facts of the past in a sincere manner and portray a fictional world while maintaining the impression of reality. 
One of the key elements removed from the earlier draft once Anno took over was personal drama like romance and family connection. Anno wanted to run a tight ship and anything that didn't contribute to the plot was on the cutting board, which led to new friction between him and Toho. While Anna was aiming for a detached, plot-centric approach, something he expressed interest in from the start, Toho wanted the personal drama retained and repeatedly requested more and more of it, until Anno reached his breaking point. Anno highlighted the growing difference between his initial memo and what the script was turning into and told Toho if they wanted to continue with their current course of focusing on human drama, there was no need to have him involved and that he would leave the project. Consequently, Toho backed down and let Anno have his way. In Anno's own words, it was stressful for me to meet the producer's request to include human drama in the story, such as the problems of the protagonist's lover or the protagonist's family. A Godzilla film does not need such things. I don't completely reject the opinions of sponsors. However, if I feel that it is not appropriate for the film, I have to get rid of it as much as possible. So what did Anno have in mind? Well, as noted in The Art of Shin Godzilla, he explained, There were a few films that I knew that I wanted to make. Among them, I had a strong image of war films directed by Kihachi Okamoto, such as Japan's Longest Day. Later in the same interview, Anno added, I have always preferred films that objectively depict the solemnly changing situation and have little subjective drama from the characters. I also like Toho's war stories such as The Retreat from Kiska, Japan's Longest Day, and Battle of Okinawa because they are character dramas and do not overly depict emotions. Rather, the actions of the people coping with the situation themselves become the conflicts and ups and downs of the drama, which I like. At this point, it should be no surprise that one of the biggest influences on Hideaki Anno and his unique style is Kihachi Okamoto. Anno once said, When I am asked who my favorite director is, I answer, Kihachi Okamoto, without a second's hesitation. Additionally, Anno admitted that Okamoto's 1971 film, Battle of Okinawa, is the movie he's watched the most in his life, over 100 times, and that does seem to reflect in his work. In fact, the mysterious scientist introduced at the beginning of Shin Godzilla, Goromaki, is represented by a picture of the late Okamoto. And the most influential of Okamoto's films on Shin Godzilla was 1967's Japan's Longest Day. The film is a treat for fans of Golden Age Toho cinema, as it is filled with many familiar faces, many of whom appeared in the Godzilla and Akira Kurosawa films of the time. Anyway, Japan's Longest Day and Shin Godzilla have much in common. Both films are ensemble pieces detailing the bureaucratic response to an unprecedented disaster. Japan's Longest Day chronicles the chaotic, real-life final days of Imperial Japan during World War II, and Shin Godzilla depicts a nation's response to the sudden appearance of a giant monster. Both films are filled with boardroom meetings, scenes of fruitless political debate while civilians suffer on the outside, a wealth of subtitles, and the films end on similar notes, the current government disbanding and making way for the next generation of leaders. Another reservation Toho had was about the changes being made to Godzilla. Anno and his team toyed with many different ideas. Two of those were Godzilla sprouting multiple heads or spawning separate bodies out of his own. Concepts Toho shot down, though eventually Toho approved of Godzilla changing forms as long as he ended in a state that resembled his traditional form. Anno shared additional insight about this during an interview at Studio Kara's 10th anniversary exhibition in 2016. なんか音質は、あの、ふとしたことなんですけど、ま、携帯が変化した方が、ま、ま、ビジュアルとしても、あと映画としても面白くないだろうし、あと、ま、東方に、東方さんが最初それ嫌がってたんですけど、やっぱ
For example, despite relying heavily on CGI and using a motion capture performance to bring Godzilla to life, the directors still incorporate a wealth of practical effects such as miniatures. And, according to special effects supervisor Atsuki Sato, Anno made the decision to have Godzilla's skin resemble rubber, rather than that of a living creature. Likely, at least in part, a nod to the man in suit roots of Godzilla and so many other Japanese giant monsters. Anyway, there were other complications during Shin Godzilla's production like the puppet getting scrapped late into production because it was thought not to be convincing enough, and the film having a tight deadline because, per contractual agreements, its production couldn't overlap with a sequel to the American Godzilla film, which was originally slated for a 2017 release. Though the last major hurdle that will be covered here was the length of the script. As writing was nearing completion, people started questioning whether there was too much content. The budget could only support a two-hour film, and the script looked to be three or four hours worth of material. So, to ensure the runtime would be suitable for the length of the script, Anno gathered voice actors together at the studio and had them run through the entire script, timing everything out and asking people to speak as quickly as possible until the material fit the time frame. Actor Hiroki Hasegawa, who played Rondo Yaguchi in the film, corroborated this account in a 2017 interview with Advert Times, where he compared the fast speaking rate to that of 2010's The Social Network. And finally, executive producer Akihiro Yamauchi provided his perspective in a 2016 interview upon seeing the gigantic script. He said, I knew I'd have to cut something. I thought about cutting the climax entirely. Looking back now, I realized that would have been impossible, but I was worried. Anno told me, no, we'll definitely make it two hours. I thought, yeah, right. I've heard so many directors tell me the same thing. With the action scenes, plus the end credits, it came in at two hours. That convinced me a little bit. Now, let's look at some other inspirations and references Shin Godzilla contains. To start, former AKB48 idol Atsuko Maeda makes a cameo appearance in the film, as does actor Takumi Saito, and Saito went on to play the lead character of 2022's Shin Ultraman. And, speaking of the Ultra series, one of its most defining figures was Akio Soji, who had been with the series from the start. He directed the Father of Ultra Q documentary, and his unique way with the camera, evident as early as his debut, arguably became the visual style of the Ultra series itself. And since Anno has been a lifelong fan of the Ultra series, visuals evocative of Jisoji's dreamlike, provocative, and often starkly lit imagery can be readily found in Anno's output. Therefore, it's worth noting that Akio Soji's wife, Chisako Hara, has a cameo appearance in Shin Godzilla. She is the woman being carried piggyback by a man early in the film. Chisako has a long history as an actress, and even prior experience in tokusatsu media. Here she is in episode 37 of Ultraman Leo. Next, Anno cited the military battles from the original space battleship Yamato anime series as a source of inspiration, and the final minutes of Shin Godzilla are set on the same rooftop as the climax of 1979's The Man Who Stole the Sun. And if you're curious whether that was a mere coincidence, the second rebuild of Evangelion film, You Cannot Advance, features a track from the aforementioned 1979 political satire film. Oh yeah, on the subject of music, Anno pulls from classic Godzilla films and his own previous works. For example, Decisive Battle, the popular strategic theme from Evangelion, sees plenty of use in Shin Godzilla, and, also worth noting, owes a lot to a track from the 1963 007 film, From Russia With Love. But Decisive Battle isn't the only Evangelion music to see use in Shin Godzilla. An instrumental version of Famously, a bonus song from You Cannot Reduce soundtrack, is what plays in the aftermath of Godzilla's mid-film destruction of Tokyo. Some other cool references include this scene here where Asuka Langley from Evangelion and Cassette Girl from episode 35 of the Japan Animator Expo can be seen as profile pictures on a social media site. Later, during Godzilla's nighttime attack on Tokyo, another short from the Japan Animator Expo can be spotted on a few TVs not tuned into the news like the others, and that short was based on a manga called The Diary of Ochibi-san, created by Anno's wife, Mayoko Anno. And lastly, beyond needing a skyscrapers for the final operation, the climax of Shin Godzilla is set in West Shinjuku as a nod to the return of Godzilla, and because that is where Toho was preparing to build the Godzilla Hotel at the time. As mentioned earlier, despite the decent performance of Godzilla 2014 in Japan, there were still many questions about the state of the series. Did interest exist beyond one film? Years earlier, 2004's Godzilla Final Wars, the previous Japanese Godzilla film, ended up being a massive commercial failure, topping off a long line of box office disappointments and cementing the cultural irrelevancy the series had been sliding into for years at that point. In a November 2004 interview, Final Wars director Yuhei Kitamura asserted that Godzilla no longer appealed to general audiences. It was something only supported by maniac Godzilla fans and children. But his assessment may have been generous as, that same year, Godzilla producer Shogo Tomiyama admitted even children had lost interest in Godzilla, their hearts and minds stolen by IP like Pokemon. Now, 
A decade-long hiatus and American reboot later, Toho had been encouraged by the performance of Godzilla 2014 to move forward with a film of their own. But with the novelty of the first modern Godzilla film now gone, what could be done to attract attention for another film? Well, since Anno owned one of the biggest franchises on Earth, why not use it to promote his Godzilla film? And that's exactly what happened. Announced on April 1st, 2016, exactly a year removed from Shin Godzilla's original reveal, the collaboration was originally described as a film. However, Toho quickly clarified that, while talk of a film was an April Fool's Day joke, the crossover between Godzilla and Evangelion was real. So along came figures, towels, video game appearances, and artwork from high-profile artists like Takashi Murakami and Mahiro Maeda, which involved a lot of mixing and matching iconography from both franchises and some creative, and at times, eccentric ways. But to briefly highlight some of the more notable points, in 2017, there was a full orchestra performance featuring music from both franchises that was later released as an album, Shin Godzilla vs. Evangelion Symphony. Godzilla vs. Evangelion The Real 4D was an attraction at the Osaka Universal Studios Japan theme park from May 31st to August 25th of 2019. And believe it or not, six years since the first merchandise and the release of Shin Godzilla, the collaboration is still going. Earlier this year, Godzilla and Evangelion were joined by Kamen Rider and Ultraman in the Shin Japan Heroes Universe multimedia collaboration to promote the anthology series of which Shin Godzilla, Shin Ultraman, Shin Evangelion, and the upcoming Shin Kamen Rider are a part of. But the most recent addition is the upcoming P, Godzilla vs. Evangelion, G-Cell Awakening, a pachinko game featuring new songs from Yoko Takahashi, singer of the original Evangelion opening theme song, and Megami Hayashibara, voice actress of Rei Nami. You're probably aware that Hideaki Anno and Shinji Higuchi's hard work paid off. The film was a success. What you might not know is the extent to which it paid off. Selling over 5.69 million tickets, Shin Godzilla shattered early expectations of only 3 million tickets, sold more tickets than the first three legendary Godzilla films combined, and became the biggest kaiju film in the Japanese market since 1962's King Kong vs. Godzilla. More impressively, it was the second biggest Japanese film at box office for 2016, behind only the anime film Your Name. And by the way, maybe history really does repeat itself because 62 years earlier, Godzilla was defeated at Japanese box office by a film with a title that translates to Your Name. While these films aren't related beyond their titles and sharing a premise about circumstances keeping potential young lovers apart, not to mention the older film being the final installment of a blockbuster trilogy and a live action film, this, if nothing else, does make for an amusing historical footnote. Anyway, Shin Godzilla's success didn't end at the box office. Its Blu-ray became the first in Japanese history to exceed 100,000 copies sold. The film achieved an insane 15% viewership rate the first time it aired on Japanese TV in 2017, and it swept various award ceremonies, even the Japanese Academy Awards, winning Best Director and Best Picture, making Shin Godzilla easily the most acclaimed Godzilla film that isn't the original. So, all of that, in addition to the merchandising juggernaut this version of the character has proven to be, Shin Godzilla is basically the face of Godzilla in Japan right now. Perhaps most tellingly, in 2018, a Shin Godzilla statue replaced the Versus series Godzilla statue in Hibiya Park. The Versus series statue, based on a design that has more or less represented the series since 1989, was relocated to the inside of the nearby Toho Theater. So, Shin Godzilla wasn't only a success, it was a massive success across the board. And, to quickly wrap things up, Here's a comment from Godzilla historian Steve Rifle. Uh, the film was extremely popular. It won all sorts of major awards in Japan, which is somewhat surprising given that Godzilla really isn't all that super popular in Japan anymore. Uh, Godzilla's audience seems to have shifted overseas somewhat in recent years. Anyway, what Shin Godzilla fact did you find most interesting? Let me know in the comments section below. By the way, did you know the channel has a Discord server? Drop by and check it out if you would like to talk to some cool people about all things anime or tokusatsu. You can find the link below. And if you want to see more videos like this, consider giving a thumbs up or subbing to the channel. And a special thanks to my patrons, Daijikubo, Brandon Nereal, Monkey Pant, Nick Lenz, Puppy Buds, and Michael Stevens. I appreciate you all a bunch. And until next time, take care.